Hi there, my name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And at the moment I'm doing a series called In Conversation With. And today I find myself in conversation with Joey Razdin. Joey, how are you? I'm doing well, how about you, sir? I, I can't complain, thanks. Clinging to the wreckage. Oh, okay, there, there, there <laughs> we go. It's not over until the fat lady sings. Yeah, but we're looking for that fat lady because then we're going to get her to sing so this can be done and dusted, Joey. Yeah, the band will also play over, on. Is it the you, band plays on? The band plays on, like rearranging the deck chairs on the bloody Titanic. That's what this is all about. Yes. <laughs> yes. Where, where we're looking are, for a fat lady. <laughs> where are you currently in lockdown? I'm at my house in observatory. Observatory Johannesburg or Observatory Cape Town? Uh, the, uh, observatory Johannesburg. Observe uh, the trees. Observe the trees. Mm. And and mm. what is mm. what is Joey doing to keep himself from going mad, basically, like the rest of us? Uh, right now, I'm catching my vitamin D, my daily vitamin D outside. Okay. So I'm outside now. So I'm I'm catching my daily vitamin D while I'm having a conversation with you, David Batshaffen. Well, thank you so very much, Mr. Razdin. Work-wise, mm. are, you, are you able to still commute, if that is no. such a word? No. So, so have you pivoted into being something else? Like, you know, that seems to be the new catchphrase. No. So you I'm just... one of those guys that, yeah, that's, that um, is just praying and wait for the Lord's blessing. Okay. The but Lord will provide. I see that uh, NDZ is provided because I see smoke drifting past the camera lens. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you at least got some of those in reserve. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> Joey, I'm a question that I've asked all my guests up until now yeah. is tell me about Joey Rasdin in matric. Tell me about Joey at school. What, did, what, what were you like and what did you want to do when you left school? It's funny you should mention that. Eh? So when I was in matric, uh, actually in standard eight was the first year I got, that time there wasn't um, sports. There wasn't, it was SACOS, uh, it wasn't unified sport. Okay. So it was prior, prior to the 94 elections, prior to UCB and prior to CSA. So I played cricket and I played cricket for the then um, under the SACOS, uh, SACOS, South African Congress of Sports uh, banner. Um, and I made a Transvaal, that time it was still Transvaal, it wasn't Gauteng. I made a Transvaal um, high school team from Standard 8, 9 and Matric. And in Matric wow. I was vice captain actually. And then um, I got a half scholarship to go to Rao, at the time it was Rao, R-A-U, Rans Afrikaans University, um, to play cricket for, for Rao. But um, yeah, and, and it didn't work out and I understand now why it didn't work out then. That our, at that time, I was a bit naive and I didn't know what was what. Although I was politically active, I just didn't understand the um, systematic exclusion um, that was happening at the time. And then now it's coming to the fore with Black Lives Matter and stuff. But at the time, I was like probably the only colored guy in the row team. Um, uh, that was back then, and, and I never played first team. I always played like third team or second team. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to become a cricketer, but uh, that was always my first love, and oh, I always thought I was basically good enough to become a, a, a professional cricketer. Um, but circumstances was different then, and yeah, it wasn't a lack of trying, but um, and I don't want to make excuses for anything, but I understand now why. Um, it was so difficult for me to um, pursue that. Um, so that was me in matric. That was me in school. I remember in grade, now it's called grade 10, I think, or grade 9, uh, in standard 7, um, in standard 6 and standard 7, that was quite difficult years because that was like proper state of emergency years um, and prior to that as well. Like the late 80s, early 90s was before Matiba came out of prison. And mm. even after Matiba came out of prison, that two-year period was like lots of civil unrest and it was like lots of Inkata and ANC fighting. 
and where we were staying, it was hardcore. Um, I remember in my first year varsity, um, we were staying in town, in Market Street, in, uh, in, in those flats. And the, the, I remember this clearly. I went to the taxi rank and the taxi driver said, no, go home. And I was like, why? Then he's like, just go home, lock up and be safe. As I got home, I could hear the Inkata Freedom Party MP guys from the hostel in mm -hmm. Town coming down Market Street, um, Commissioner Street uh, and Jeppy Street, coming down. Like they were basically in Market, in Commissioner and all the way to Jeppy and walking down to the library gardens. And from the other side, it was the ANC guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was there. And then we stayed um, like two blocks away from the library gardens. Mm -hmm. And you, all you could hear was AK 47s and guys that was. And I went to go stand on a balcony, and all I saw was fighting. It was just fighting. And then the Caspers came in, and the Mellow Yellows. I don't know if the people know what's a Mellow Yellow. A Mellow Yellow is that the Yellow Casper. Mm -hmm. That time the yellow caspers were still there, and the yellow caspers came in, and yeah, so that was my school. My school, high school, was a, was um, unrest. I guess, I guess it's not too different to lockdown, actually. <laughs> Except it uh, doesn't have so much about people fighting in the streets, Joey. Luckily, yeah, yeah, but it's not so different to lockdown, actually, because I remember there was a stage in Standard Six when we were younger. We couldn't go out. There was a year where we couldn't go out, I think it was either 86 or 87, where we were not allowed to leave the, our area. We're not allowed mm -hmm. to leave our area, let alone leave our street. And the army came in and the army used to become teachers. So you, here you get these um, young Jewish white oaks uh, and these young African, Africans boys that just joined the army and they in their full army gear with their arrows vector rifles and stuff and they trying to keep the peace and I remember they were teachers actually they used, yeah. used to teach the children um, teaching maths and Afrikaans and, and English and stuff and and let's just say lots of us were really good at maths because we were nervous you were nervous you can't make that because <laughs> now this, this guy with the gun teaching um, so yeah what? that was that was my school career basically did you did you go on to complete any studies at varsity? No, not really. I failed, fail. I failed, fail. I so I did BSc Biological Sciences, and then um, BSc Biological Sciences, and then I failed, completely failed. It was miserable. And then I did BCom, and then mm -hmm. I got uh, um, yeah, and then I did BCom. I didn't complete it at the university. I went round Knox. There was this thing called round Knox. Um, was similar to UNISA, but it was at Rao. Mm -hmm. um, and then I worked at Alexander Forbes and then I went to Old, Old Mutual to do Certified Financial Planner. Is that your mm. qualification? Certified that's Financial Planner? Wow, yes, I, I, am I am impressed. So, so mm. where, where did the, the change come from, come for you into the career we all know and love you in, you know, a comedian, television presenter, that type of thing? Mm. So uh, I was married. My first wife, she passed away now, but she passed away like 14 years ago. But my first wife, um, I met at Alexander Forbes and, and then we got married. And then she was like, look, you guy, why don't you go do something that you really love? And I know you love stand up. And I think you, and then I was like, there's not lots of stand up. I'm going to be the only, the only Muslim guy at the time was Riyad Musa. And yeah. the only colored guys at the time was Mark Lottering, Kurt Kunrad, and Stuart Taylor. And there was no other people that was like, so the, 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 the five colored guys at the time that I that did stand up was, uh, and Solly Philander, obviously, but a, a pure stand up, it was Kurt Kunrad, um, Stuart Taylor, Riyad Musa, and mm -hmm. then Mark Lottering. Yeah. And then Solly Philander. Um, and then I was like, yo. And then, and then she was like, no, just go do it. And then I went to go do uh, an open spot at the underground that was 
the underground legend, the comedy underground Every, in Melbourne. Everybody legend. talks about cool runnings in the underground. Every single comedian that I've interviewed over the past few months talks with such yeah. love about that place and the beginnings yeah. of, of their career. And for a lot of people... Yeah, it was my beginning what? as well. Funny thing is, me and Darren Simpson, wicked, yeah. we were the same, the exact same night. We started together on the same night. We were both doing open spot, spots the same night. Right. Yeah, and, and the lineup was, um, John Blissmus was obviously the, the host, and then Bevan Cullinan, and, and then David Cow and Chris, Chris Forrest and David Cow. So mm. they were like, like the, the, the headliners. And then, yeah, and then at the time, you must remember, it was David Cow, Kakiso Latija, Tsepo Mohali, Luis Okola. But they were the only black dudes that was yeah. doing, um, and Ronnie Modimola, well, only the, the only black dudes that was doing stand-up. So when we got there, um, so yeah, that's how I got into it. And then we started a Pure Manati show. And, but basically, it was my, my wife that said to me, my late wife that said mm. to me, yo, guy, why don't you go do something that you love? Um, she always used to say that uh, um, you, you can't be... You, life is too short not to love your best life. Yeah. I, I always yeah. equate that. I say life is too short to eat bad bagels. There's not enough time to eat yeah. those things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. what was the audience at Cool Runnings like, Joey? Was it produ what, what was the demographic of the audience that you were playing to? I mean, if you and Wackhead were on the same bill, both doing opening, and, and I mean, it's totally different audiences that you would have played to, surely. Yeah, so the audience that we played to mostly was students mm -hmm. from UJ and from Wits. And the demographic would have been uh, mostly... Um, like I would say 50% white students and then like the other 50% would be scattered between Indian, very, very few colored people, but it would be Indians and funny enough, Jason Goliath, he was, they actually came to come watch me, come watch us at Cool Runnings before they were even thinking about becoming stand-up comedians. They right. were always at Cool Runnings at the time, yeah. Um, yeah. just watching. Just just watching yeah. for like four years, just watching comedy. Um, so the demographic was mostly students. And then you, you have, and then people that heard about it, like people that was comedy lovers that heard about it would come. Uh, that, that sort of, it was there for a, a long while and then it virtually vanished overnight. One week it was there and the next week it was gone, basically, which was very sad. Yes. Yes. Because I don't think at the moment there are any pure comedy venues left anymore. Because now it's always a club. There's one. There is? Parkers. Parkers. Oh, of course, of course. I forgot about Joe. I'm, I'm sorry, Joe. My yeah. apologies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I mean... And in the Alpha Comedy Club now? Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the... That's basically... And then in Cape Town we have the... Cape Town Comedy Club. So basically mm. in South Africa, there's like three, basically. Yeah. yeah, it's not like the States or like New York where there are dozens of clubs that you can yeah, literally yeah, yeah. walk from one club to the next. And they're pure comedy clubs. And people who go there, yes. go there expecting comedy. They don't go there expecting to see strippers and then perhaps they'll put on comedy somewhere after the, yeah. after the dessert type of thing. Uh, yeah. have, have, you yeah. played, have you played venues like that, Joey, where you have been booked after i don't know after a stripper and then all of a sudden when you walk into the room they go uh -uh, let's just have another stripper and then you've got to play to the, this sort of audience yes i've done i've done but that was nice that was a nice gig though really that was a gig but that was run by tony d king i don't know if you know tony king oh tony i remember king. tony yes so tony had a gig somewhere in benoni and <laughs> i didn't know at first what it was and then i went um, and it was nice. It was an afternoon gig. Um, so you on at 12, at 2, and mm -hmm. the place opens at 12, like the first trippers is on at 1, and then you on at 2, <laughs> and then the next trippers is on at 3. It was nice, though. I love that. I like that. Gig. It was, really? Uh, it was a, it's an easy money gig, and it's also, um, it was on, a, I think, a Friday afternoon. So guys that come from work, 
that before they want to see the strippers, they want to have some sort of entertainment and there you did. So the material was easy. It was easy material to use because you're like, ah, you just came from work now. And now you're sitting here and then you're waiting for some vagina and then here's this guy that's on stage now. Yeah. So it was and then they had a bra also. They had like a so I don't know what was the entrance fee. I think it was like, I don't know, some ridiculous amount. But then you get food and you get everything. It's like mm -hmm. the whole afternoon until the next <laughs> Till the evening, yeah. <laughs> so you what? do the gig, then yeah. you take your money because they pay you in cash and then you leave. So you don't have to hang about because I'm sure you've also done some of those gigs where you've had to wait. There have been 15 comedians. They start at 8 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go until midnight and then the pr promoter won't pay you until the last comedian has gone on stage. So if you were number yeah. one, two or three, you've now got to sit from like 9 o'clock until 1 in the morning waiting for the producer to pay you your money. Yeah, but those those days are over. Right? That was like yeah, that was at the beginning stages of yeah. of comedy. Yeah, but it, in the in the past ten years, it's not been like that. Like prior to that, like uh, maybe in the early two thousands, like when we started, it was like that. Yeah, when I started, it was like that. So, how but then you... after, and then it became more professional. It was yeah. just like more professional. Yeah. Well, that's the way it should be. How do you classify your comedy, your style of comedy? Um, you know me, Dave. So, yeah, I'd but like other people to, don't, Joey. Uh, I'd like to think um, I have in-depth observations of the human psyche <laughs> and how that plays a role in the way we act. Right. You'd like to think and that. I think, uh, <laughs> You'd I like think to do. think that. <laughs> no, I don't like to think it. I think I do, though. I think my material yeah, you... is, 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 is basically um, from a psychological point of view. Yeah. The observations of how stupid, how we react to certain things is not like stereotypes. The stereotypes is there is because of the psyche. It's mm. because where you grew up. It's because of your situation. So I like to explore that in my comedy as to why people will act the way they act why um and then the other thing is why certain people find certain things funny and others don't and others find it offensive and why certain people like you know so why the audience feel that you went over the line there and mm -hmm. another audience feel like no you were brilliant there so that is the so that's the the type of comedy that i like to think I do mostly, and I think that's why corporate people like me because um, I, it's not as offensive. It's 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 a double-edged sword, but it makes you think. It makes yeah. go, oh wow, yeah. Because I I believe that that's what comedy should do. But what you what you're saying now, it's the same reason people are, are scared of snakes and spiders because they're just told to be scared of snakes and spiders. Their yeah, parents yeah, yeah, yeah. taught them. Their parents Point taught them. It, it, that's exactly it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, if you go to some, if you go to a comedy set, somebody like yourself, and you realize very quickly that you're not there to offend, you're there to make people mm -hmm. laugh and to laugh at themselves. And I think that's mm -hmm. where, where people now, where we find ourselves in 2020 is we've gotten to a, a point, rightly or wrongly, where lots of stuff offends. Everybody wants mm -hmm. to be very PC and people are too scared to laugh at those on the edge jokes lest somebody mm, goes mm. oh you are and you go no mm. you know i'm not mm. i'm not non-binary i'm i'm happy with my bind so let me mm. laugh at, at those sort of jokes if i want it's, to. it's the triggers you see what happens is in the past people didn't understand triggers so because people go to um psychologists now and because information is more freely available these days People understand triggers, mm. so um, so something might trigger you that the comedian said. That's got nothing to do with the comedian, but it's got everything to do with yourself. And yeah. then now you that's a trigger, and then that's where you find the offense. So that's where the um, uh, um, the anger comes from. Yeah, not because of what he said. It's because of what he triggered in mm. you mm. by saying that. How do you deal with hecklers, Joey? I love Eclis. Eclis is godsend. 
do you have Excellence is do you I have sort of stock phrases about, that 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 if somebody is heckling you from the audience you've got to put down immediately uh it depends it depends on the circumstance in the in the crowd mm -hmm. it depends on the evening as well like if the ceo heckles you then you have to go <laughs> that's the guy that's playing my yeah that's the guy that's playing for me to be yeah. here so best i don't have anything to say to him right now <laughs> but if you want to continue with your speech sir please continue yeah. i'll wait yeah. i i happen to to be doing opening for a particular tv show at carnival city full audience i remember three, that i remember three and, that. Half, three and a half thousand people and I, the only guy in the Springer. no was it no this was for a different it was a talent competition it wasn't for jerry um oh. but i the only person i picked on in the audience happened to be my sister-in-law's boss i didn't know it he was just making yeah. a noise and because he made a noise he he attracted yeah. my attention and and a, yeah. a line that i used to use very regularly to shut people up and then uh, on monday he the, that was on the weekend on the monday he discovered who i was and my uh, sister-in-law got the sharp end of the stick and i had to please explain to her that i did not know that he was her boss yeah. and I picked on it on him. Mm. I picked on him because he was mm. making a noise. And then he, yeah. and, he and he laughed together with the other 2,999 uh. people in that room. Uh. So, you know, but sometimes as you say, you've got to be careful. If it's the boss and he's not laughing, then you're in trouble. Yeah, then you are, then you are, <laughs> yeah. But it's also, it's also, it also comes from a place of privilege sometimes. So people come to comedy and then they go, make me laugh yep. if you don't make me laugh i will show you so yeah. it comes from that place of entitlement um whereas if you're going to come and enjoy yourself it's a different story yeah, um, I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent but by the same token joey you know that if it's a room full of people there's always one that is sitting like this yes and that's the one that catches your eye Yes. Right? But then often those people will come to you at the end of a gig and go, I loved your material. And you go, but yes. Drew, why didn't you unfold your arms and at least laugh once? Laugh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you have people that um, consume your product differently. Yeah. So, you, yeah, and, and, and some of the consumers is out there. And I prefer a person that's folding and listening mm -hmm. than to a person that it will laugh out loud like laugh out and just for attention sake i prefer a person that doesn't laugh and listen to mm -hmm. a person that is laughing just because laughing yeah because that that's just an it's a it's a it's, a, it's almost like a heckle then he's using his yeah laugh it's as like a heckle. heckle yeah yeah jo like a heckle. joey when you've performed overseas um mm -hmm. where have, have you performed to to international audiences or mainly to expats living living in other countries um i actually the only time i performed mostly to expats living in other countries was in dubai mm -hmm. that that's the only place i can think of the other places that i performed I, in london and in i didn't perform in the us but in in a, the only other international gigs i did was um, the normal ones and in the african ones so okay. In the ones in London was um, different audiences. There was like Arabs the one day, there was Nigerians the other day, <laughs> then there was some South Africans the other day, then there was um, guys out on a jaw. Yeah. That, that's also one of the best gigs because if you're not funny, they're gonna yeah, annihilate you. It but becomes, if you're funny, yeah. then they love you. So I love that gigs because that that is like it tests your your metal. It tests your mm. your um, material, and it tests you as a comedian. And I love those gigs where if you're not funny, they're gonna let you know you're not funny. Combat and combat comedy. Yeah, you have to have hair on your teeth. Like when <laughs> we started, I remember when we started. Joe Parker had all these gigs, and I would I am greatly greatly indebted to Joe for getting us to do these gigs mm. like in in um so one night you'll be in bloomfontein performing to farmers 
<laughs> and then the next night, you be in um, Kimberley performing to minors. <laughs> and then the next night, you be in um, uh, Mabopani performing to people from Shashonguve. <laughs> and then the next night, you be in Carnival City performing to people from Brakpan. <laughs> now you can imagine, you can't use the same material. <laughs> you can't. So you have to have hair on your teeth. And that is actually, most of us, like I, rem I, I, can, I can attest to this, Chris Forrest, myself, um, even David Kahiso, we did those gigs. Yeah. And those gigs made us realize that, because um, at the time, the audiences was also different. There was different nuances also. Mm. So now, yeah, so it prepared us to be able to perform to every type of audience in South Africa. And that is, and that was great. And for yeah. that, um, I have to take my hat off to Joe. I, I, I was in a club some years ago. It was an open mic night and some poor fellow, I think he was an accountant trying out some material. He stepped up on stage and he said, hello, my name is Bob and I'm schizophrenic. And somebody in the audience just shouted out, then why don't both of you piss off? That was the end of his set. The poor fella just left this. He came on stage left and went off stage right. Thank you and good night. That, that, that sounds like um, what people you do at cool runnings, right? Eh? At cool runnings, we had this thing called ice. Like if you really cut and then the audience had the, the um, permission to throw you with ice. Oh, or if wow. you repeat, yeah, if you repeat your co jokes, if there's an audience member that saw you before and you repeat your jokes, that audience member can throw you with ice saying and complete your joke. No, <laughs> that must be, yeah. Dead. Well, look, it keeps you on your toes because you don't know who's in, and it also makes you yeah, yeah, yeah. not be lazy because some of us, and myself included, from time to time, you. You go back to your old material because you're comfortable with it and you know what works and you yeah. know what doesn't. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day... So that's the thing. Yeah. So, so that was the whole purpose of the underground. John Blissmus, um, he was the... He ran it, him and Bevan Kalinen. Yeah. And he gave the audience permission to do that for the reason that the only way we are going to improve is to write new material and yeah. to get uh, 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 a rapport with a crowd going. So there were some nights at Cool Runnings where I went on stage with no material, absolutely nothing. But because I had a rapport with the crowd, then material just flowed. Whether it's yeah. funny or not, they understand that, okay, this guy is coming here with no material and he's just going to come and, and try and, and write a set while he's on stage. Yeah. And that night was the best night for me. When P I don't think people realize, there's two things that I don't think audience members realize, Joey. One is when you're starting out as a comedian, that first five minutes, five minutes is actually about a year and a half if you're standing on stage and it's not working for you. If it's working, yeah, yeah, yeah. five minutes is 30 seconds. By the time yeah. you said, hello, my name is, and they're on the floor with laughter, your set is yeah. over. Um, yeah. so that's the one thing I don't think they realize. And also, you can't really rehearse material. Um, Mel Miller yeah. said to me once that you uh, stand-up comedy is the only form of comedy or the only uh, form where you rehearse your material in front of a live audience. Because yeah. you're standing in front of a mirror at home and what you think is funny isn't and what you don't think is funny is. But that's just dependent on the people in the audience and on the night. Mm. So Mark Banks, Mark Banks said to me once, <laughs> if you are able to perform to goats, <laughs> and not feel insecure <laughs> about your material, then you've made it. When, when I started, I don't know if you remember a place called... Um, Hurricanes. No, before Hurricanes. It was at the, at the Civic Theatre, the Punchline Pub. That's where I performed. Oh, the Punchline. The yeah, yeah, that was, that, that was De Dennis Gordon and that, those guys. So, so that was my, my, my beginnings. 
and Mark Banks yeah. was in the audience one evening. And if you remember there, and he echoed you. He did worse than that. You came on from behind, and Mark was a friend already. I, I, I know, I knew him. So you'd come yeah. on from behind the stage, and when you finished your set, you just stepped off your off the stage into the audience and went to sit down. And Mark, yeah. when I stepped off the stage, he was clapping like a demented person. As I got level with him, he just quietly said to me, "You stepped off the stage really, really nicely, David." And I went, "Thank you, Mark." <laughs> He's legend, that guy. There was one time, I think I was new. So I was like in my first year of stand-up and I get booked to perform to, with Mark mm -hmm. at this place called Saints. It's like 30 people in the audience, but the, the place can hold 3,000 people. So it's just... <laughs> so it's, it's me and Banks. Yeah. So I'm opening for Banks. And I die. I die on my... I like die. Like, yo. It's like, my goodness. <laughs> like, I was inexperienced and stuff. Right. And then Banks walks on stage. He takes the mic from me and he goes, let's see if I can make these stuck-up fuckers laugh to me. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> <laughs> then he's like, ladies and gentlemen, that is a future star of South African comedy and you guys were lucky to see us here, to see him here today. Um, and then I watched him and I watched him perform. And yes, and that's the night when he told me, Joey, you must be able to perform to goats. I love that. You see what you did was, what you did was, you started to um, disbelieve in your material and disbelieve yeah. in yourself. And then the audience picked up on it. And then they went, ah, this guy is taking chances. Whereas Mark Banks is like, yo, fucker, you. Are you the CEO? <laughs> <laughs> You're the CEO. Okay. Yeah, it's, like, then, it's like lions watching a herd of zebra. And there's one zebra limping. And that was you. And that, that yeah, yeah, lines yeah. Where that's our meal yeah, for yeah. tonight. Yeah, yeah, that's our meal for this, this <laughs> evening. So you can't, you have to, and then, but then, but then what happened was the bulletproofness, and I just want to get something to drink. The sure. bulletproofness, the, um, what came in was, because you did all these gigs for Joe Parker, you became like bulletproof. You became, like I remember I did one gig in Canada. Yeah. This was one of the hardest gigs I've done, but I, I came out brilliant. Mm -hmm. So I go on stage at Yak Yaks. It's called Yak Yaks. Right. I don't know if you know Yak Yaks Comedy Club. No. So the first night we performed, and that time it was just after 9 11. This is like years ago, 2008. You know when it was 9 11? Yeah. Um, so 9 11 was still fresh in people's minds and stuff. And I do this 9-11 gag and it falls flat, 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 flat. Then I was like, yo, and then I do another gag and it falls flat. And then people started to speak amongst themselves. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on here? Now I'm dying. Now my friend that was with me then, David Kibuka, who's mm -hmm. the writer of, at, he's now a writer on the, the Daily Show with Trevor. Right. Kibuka is there and he's feeling so sorry for me. He gets up and he leaves. And I see ah, my only friend that had my support. <laughs> he leaves the venue. <laughs> then I was like, no, man. Uh, and then I went back to cool runnings mode. In the cool runnings mode mm -hmm. where I, just, I was just like, you know, don't do material. If you are going to die, Die with stuff that you just made up about what you experienced in Canada. Right. And, and I remember I stayed in a place called Yonge Street. Yonge Street is like one of the, the, the longest streets in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was like telling the people, no, I stay in Yonge Street at the Delta Chelsea Hotel. And luckily for me, at the same day, there was a murder in the hotel. <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, then they cordoned off the whole hotel and we all had to go into investigations and stuff. Then I was like, thank you so much for making me feel at home. Because um, we have a murder every 30 seconds in South Africa. In Canada, apparently there's one every year. And the one <laughs> happened last night. 
<laughs> at the Delta Chelsea. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, then I got this interest now. Now they're trying to speak to me. Now they're listening to me because now I'm speaking about something that's familiar to them. And then I, all I did was speak about the street I stayed on. They mm -hmm. had a strip club called Zanzibar. I was like, the Zanzibar that I know is there's topless people, but they're on the beach. Yeah. The Zanzibar that you know, there's topless people, but they on the pole. And, <laughs> and so on and so on. And then by the time Kabuka walks in, now he's like, wow. And by the time he walks in, now I'm killing it. <laughs> so much so that the, the guys is like, no, you have to headline tomorrow. Because if you come with that same material tomorrow, uh, yeah, it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna kill. So then I realized that um, it's very, for a comedian, it's very important for you to be able to read your audience. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were to give any, any budding comedians words of advice, is that, is that the overriding one? Read the room correctly. No, the overriding one is be funny. <laughs> you mean the comedians who aren't funny, Jerry? Uh, you can't call yourself a comedian if you're not funny. You know, I've, I've started watching um, while I'm in lockdown, I'm working from home. And mm. I've discovered a thing called dry bar comedy. It's a yeah, comedy yeah, yeah, club yeah, yeah, yeah. in Utah. I don't know if you if you've seen it. Yeah, online. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I've there's no it. alcohol in the room, mm. and mm. and you can't use rude language on stage. Yeah, profanity. Yeah. Yeah, but they are yeah. funny. Those guys and the majority of yeah, them are very older, com older comedians, and the and yeah. the majority of those just do um, observational comedy about themselves. Yeah, yeah. and that's and the I, key. This is it. And, and I watch every day, one in the morning when I'm having mm. breakfast, and it, it uh. puts me in a good mood for the rest of the day. Yeah, and they that's the key. So and in Utah, there's, and then you must remember also, there in Utah, there's nothing to do, no. basically. <laughs> unless you're, a, unless like you're a, a Mormon, and then you can have lots of wives. Yeah, that's <laughs> like a combination of Springs and Bialvo and Brakpan <laughs> put together. Do you play the East Rand often? You like box, box birds, uh, I, yeah, band, I haven't Springs played the East Rand for like years now, eh? Mm. Like years. The last time was at um, when Wacket had his club at Carnival City. That was right. the last. Okay. Yeah. So, so mm. what are you doing? I know I asked asked you this question when we started talking. Mm. What are you mm. What are you doing to set yourself? I, I'm not up earning for an income. Nothing. Let's. I'm not earning an income. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, um, yeah, it says as simple as we do online corporates. Mm -hmm. So we do online corporates. I did a, a, a another, uh, awards, awards evening online. I did another comedy for the big bank. So, you know, your normal clients that you have, your corporate yeah. clients, they still book you for online gigs. So that's, but, um, there's no public gigs. The only no, public gigs is like the online, uh, the online ones, yeah. and I, I don't because comedy is new ones. I don't feel that my comedy will translate um, as as good as it would translate um, in in real life. But also, Joey, with with the online stuff, um, isn't it isn't it difficult when you, as you say, you go, you're playing to an audience and you need them to feed, you need to feed off them. But when you're yes. doing it online, you don't have that mm. luxury because, yes. you know, people are, you don't know what people are doing. Yes, they bought a ticket to come and watch you online, yeah. but they, they click on and then they go and make themselves a cup of tea or they perhaps wander past the television and see what's on over there. So there's all of those sort of things that you've got to take into account. It seems that Joey and I have have got stuck but this is what happens with uh, these sort of zoom conferences and either he'll come back or he'll vanish one of the two um joey if you can hear me uh can you sit yourself down somewhere that we can pick up on this we'll we'll take a moment or two and see see all right so we're still recording i don't know what's happened to joey 
Um, I, I do hope that he will come back to us. But uh, I think we got through most of what uh, we wanted to say. Uh, oh, he's, he's entered the waiting room. So how do we do? There we go. So Joey should be back with us momentarily. The beauty of, or the miracle of modern technology. Joey, are you back with us? Yes. I, I don't know what happened here. Sit yourself down. Don't move around. I think that's the, that's the lesson we need to take from that. Okay, okay. No, I think I think the, the meeting time was up. That's no, what no, I no. It warns me. It normally tells oh, okay. me uh, you have 10 minutes. So we don't like what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's quite sorry, all right. I was, like, I was like enjoying this meeting now so, so nicely because I could walk around. No, obviously you can't. We've learned that the hard way. But never mind. Um, I spoke us through it and then we came back. It's the beauty of, of um, this sort of... Um, this sort of in conversation with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, mm. where to? It's now a difficult question. So, you've still got your corporate stuff. Will you go back to stand up yeah. once the madness is over, or have you got other things? Are you going to pivot like everybody else, Joey? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Hey? I know okay. that I want to do a documentary. So, guys that's watching this, you can go watch my YouTube channel called Off the Cuff with Joey Razdin, and I interview all these guys that comes from Galvandale. So Galvandale is a colored area in Port Elizabeth. I and remember Galvandale, Galvandale well. It's my hometown so Galvandale, so Galvandale produced the most um, representatives that represented the country at the highest level in various different sports throughout really? the world. Basically, I can I, I did some research on that. Sorry, I did some research on it, and Galvandale basically um, produced more South African cricket players and more South African soccer players uh, than and than anybody anywhere else in such a small space of fifty kilometer square meters. Wow! So, yeah, Galvandale produced Alviro Peterson, um, Ashwell Prince, Robin Peterson. Uh, Garnet Kruger, Russell Domingo, uh, Shafiq Abrams, Dane Clayt, Elroy van Jurden, Kermit Erasmus, um, Denzel Dolly, Jody Paul, Andre Peters, Lionel Newton, um, Willem Jackson. All these guys, they come from Galvandale, and that's just the tip. So they produced um, Tando Manana, the first black African to captain a Springboks team, um, Galvandale produced. They produced Asho Prince, the first colored guy to mm -hmm. captain a South African cricket team, Asho Prince. Now, Asho Prince and both Robin Peterson are coaches. They from Galvandale. They fr they basically a street away from each other. Wow. That's how, how crazy it is. So, Kermit Erasmus and Denzel Dolly and um, um, Dane Clayt, for instance, they were like a few houses away from each other. It's amazing. So I'm doing a, a, a series of documentaries about them and about how, uh, what was it like for, for them to be. For them growing up in Port Elizabeth or growing up in Galvandale at that particular time in South Africa's political, career, uh, political history, it must have been extremely difficult. Uh, we've lost Joey momentarily again. He's, he's either frozen or he's taken, he's, he's thinking. This is, as I said, this is the beauty of the modern technology that we're currently using. Um, but at least I can see him. And uh, we'll, again, wait a moment. To, um, yes, I know that I'm using the computer audio. And hopefully Joey is sitting in the waiting room once more and uh, will jo join me momentarily. If you've just tuned in, well, you can't just tune in. That's the interesting thing about Zoom. You've got to have been here all the time. Otherwise, you won't know what is going on. Um, but I'm chatting with Joey Razdin, who seems to have vanished for the, the time being. Um, and we've been talking about comedy. We've been talking about the documentary that Joey's been doing. So if you want to find out more, why don't you go to Joey Razdin's um, YouTube channel and, and have a look at what he's putting together about cricket players in Galvandale, which is in Port Elizabeth. Uh, Joey, you're back with us again. Uh, yeah, you, you left. You were the one that left that time. 
I don't know who leaves. Anyway, I was just filling people in. I kept talking. So, you know, it is what it is type of thing. Um, so maybe we should... No, maybe... I'm sitting still. I'm sitting absolutely still now. Okay. So um, you were talking Galvindale, but also Port Elizabeth was also produced some wonderful theatrical people. It really and truly did. From Apple Fugard and John Carney to Winston and Shawnee and to Alice Kricher and yeah. all sorts of wonderful people. Yeah. Must be something yeah. in the water. Not forgetting my sister and I. So it must be something in the yeah. water. <laughs> I think it's the I think it's the wind. You it's think the wind that comes off the sea. Joey before what wind we... is at the southwester. Southwester, yeah. It's great for yeah, certain, the not for not for much else. But we're not the windiest city. East London is windier than Port Elizabeth. P is the friendly city. It really and truly oh. is. But before we lose but, each other again, I think I'm going to say thank you very much for being a guest on In Conversation With. I wish you all the best with the documentary. And I look forward to, yeah. to going to visit your YouTube channel and to go and have a look what, what's up there at the moment. Yes, yeah. You might. I interviewed Russell Domingo. I interviewed Ashwell Prince. I interviewed uh, Robin Peterson. I interviewed this guy called Desmond um, Jacobs. Bravo, Desmond Bravo Jacobs. Mm. Let I just say, give the viewers this guy is interesting because he played cricket with Basil de Oliveira uh, in the same right. team. Yeah. Then he got selected as a colored guy to play for a South African invitational team that included Barry Richards, Eddie Palo, Graham Pollock, Clive Rice, um, Vince van der Peel, Lee Barnard to play against a world 11 that included the Chapel brothers, um, Derek Underwood, uh, Ingo, uh, Illingworth, um, all these guys, but it was back in apartheid still. So um, they tried to uh, uh, show the world that they committed to um, non-racial racialism in sport. And he was one of the guys that got selected um, for that team. So he played a, with Graham Pollock, with um, Basil de Oliveira, and then he played soccer as well. And wow. apparently he was better at soccer. So he played for Swaraj, for PE United, for Air Dynamos, and he played against Jomasono, Eister uh, um, um, Khomani, Zain Musa, Ernest Chirwali, with them in the same. <laughs> so what guy in the world can say he played cricket with Basil de Oliveira in the same team mm -hmm. where Basil de Oliveira was his captain, and he played cricket with Graham Pollock, Perry Richards, and Clive Rice in the same team, and Eddie Palo in the same team, and he played soccer um, with Thomas Sono in the same team, and later on he played against Zain Musa, Ernest Tirwali, Dr. Kumala. What guy in the world yeah. can say that? Amazing. And he's from PE. Stories that have to be told, Joey. Yes, yes, yeah. Once again, so, thanks, for, yeah. thanks for being a guest. It was great to catch up with you. I wish you all the very best. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we can sit on the corner of 7th and 4th again here in my suburb and enjoy a cup of coffee together and watch the passing parade. Lekka, that would be so nice. Yes, win last. Win yep. last. True <laughs> enough. Joey, my guest today on In Conversation Dave. With has been Joey Razdin. Once again, Joey, thanks for chatting with me. Cheers for now.